biblical worldview makes science possible. Before the Christian worldview really emerged, people believed, based on the Greeks and the Romans, that the universe was eternal. If, it, if it's eternal, that means it never came into existence, which means that our existence here is not really knowable. We only know because we can somehow speculate about what might be the immaterial world. If there is a God force in the world, what it might be like. Welcome to the Mama Bear Apologetics Podcast. A podcast where we teach you to roar like a mother. And by roar, we mean recognize the message, offer discernment, argue for a healthier approach, and reinforce these ideas with your kids. Unless you want to growl around your house. I mean, that's cool too. <laughs> You're like, check it, we keep it reals. <laughs> that's so bad. You're awesome. Mama Bear Apologetics is a listener-supported program, so if you like what we do, head on over to the Mama Bear Apologetics website and click support. It's time to rise up, ladies. Rise up, Mama Bears. This might not affect your faith, but it might affect your children's. Welcome to another episode of Mama Bear Apologetics. We have a great guest for us today, uh, Dr. Jeff Myers from Summit Ministries. Some of y'all might remember Jeff from our podcast that we did last year, just describing what Summit does in their worldview camps. And so uh, a while back, Jeff and I met at, at a conference and we kind of did a little book trade as a lot of times authors are want to do. And I read through his book. I've got it with me right here. Truth Changes Everything. And the thing that I love so much about this book is that there are so many, we'll say accusations that are leveled at Christians that a lot of times, you know, that there's some kind of accusations and there's some kinds of abuse, I'll say, <laughs> that we as Christians, we just have to absorb. But when people are making false claims about Christianity, we can't say, well, no, that's not really quite right. And so some of these false claims would be from the um, aspect of maybe the pro-choice groups that say, oh, Christians, these pro-life people only care about you know, kids until they're born and then they don't care about in them anytime else, or they're not care, they don't care about justice. They don't care about the climate. They don't care about workers' rights. They don't care about all these different things. And they think that the secular worldview actually is the one that has more compassion and is more caring. And I think you make a, a pretty good case through, throughout this entire book, going through each of those types of accusations that are lobbied against the Christian worldview showing how not only was this not something is this not something that we're guilty of but Christianity actually paved the way kind of like um Frank Turk his book stealing from god that it's almost like you have this christian world view that provides things and then the secular realm goes thanks and they take it and they pretend like these things you know the goodness truth and beauty and all the and, and justice are all their ideas when this was really god's idea so uh, if you mamas have kids that are going off to college, I highly, highly recommend that you start looking at some of these things before they have the accusations lopped at them to, to where like before they start hating um, the church and the Christian worldview by people basically stacking the deck and having all these different anecdotal stories about how evil the church is. Let's look at what the church has historically done. So thank you so much, Jeff, for being here with us today. Oh, Hillary, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely. So tell me, uh, like, this was a little bit different than the stuff that you've done before, but I know it was birthed from a situation that you and I have both been through. So tell me about your thinking before you wrote Truth Changes Everything. Well, I'd gotten this book contract to write a book, and I wanted to write about Christian history and how Christians made a difference. But then I was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. And as you know, when you get a cancer diagnosis, y y everything gets really sharpened. Yes. This phone call I have with somebody might be the last time we get to talk. Mm -hmm. This letter I write might be the last time I get to write to this person. This decision I make in our company is going, I might not get a chance to ever adjust that. It's a, yeah. it, it brings an intensity. And as an author, it brought intensity too. If this is the last book I ever get to write, mm. what do I really, really want to say? Yes. And I went back to John 8, 32, where Jesus said, if you follow my teachings, you be my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Mm. Because as you've talked about many times on your program, 
the loss of truth creates such chaos in society yep. because if people say, look, I'm not going to seek the truth anymore. I'm just going to try to speak my truth. Then all of a sudden you're the center of your own reality. Well, congratulations. That means everything that's wrong in your life and the world is your fault. Oh, and God. there is this deep level of guilt that, that gets manifest usually in the form of anger. Mm. And, and that, and also anxiety, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, and aimlessness naturally flows from that. 75% of the young adults today say they don't have a sense of purpose. Mm. It gives meaning to their lives. And this is a worldview battle. But Jesus said, if you follow my teachings, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. and, and so I thought, let's look back in history and see how that's actually so. Is it actually true that people who believe that Jesus is the truth are the ones that change the world for the better? Did they mm -hmm. really bring blessing and flourishing or did they bring a curse? Yeah. And that's what I, that's, that was the entire book. I wrote about it and the value of human life, medical care, science, art, politics, justice, the mm -hmm. work, education, all those different areas. And, and it's so fascinating to me that it really, what Jesus said has really become true. There's so much good in the world, even in the midst of all of the bad. Yeah. And you can, and you see Jesus followers foot fingerprints all over it. Yeah. You can really trace it back to those ideas. Even if someone comes and takes those ideas and say, thanks, now we've got that. Uh, and then keeps going off in their own direction. It's still, where did that come from? And so you specifically, a couple of the ones that you specifically said that I would like to talk about, um, would specifically be in a couple, little while back, we did a, um, a case for pro-life. How is it that I would say caring for people after the womb, that Christians have really been more of a womb to tomb kind of caregiving? How, how is that different than what the accusations are being made? Well, it begins with the idea that every human being bears God's image, mm -hmm. that we have value as, 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 as image bearers of God. He's the one who made us and he gave us that value. So the material world cannot take it away. Other people cannot take it away from us. And we're obligated to understand it and value it. And, and you, you can actually go all the way back to Rome. In the time Christianity emerged in Rome, Rome was in a, a they were in a downward spiral. They had believed so much in the material, almost militaristic kind of worldview that they didn't value human life at all. So if there was a family and they had a baby, if it was a boy, they would keep it. If it was a girl, they literally just take the little girl's body and throw her out into the street and wild animals might come by and, and kill the child or might be run over in the street or just die of malnutrition. And, and Christians came along and found the babies and picked them up and brought them home and raised them as their own. That was really the beginning of the idea of adoption. And of course, there was a demographic crisis in Rome. Bad ideas always have victims and they always have bad consequences. And the demographic crisis was there were lots of boys and not enough girls. Yep. This is the same problem that Russia and China are facing in the present time. I was just thinking, I think we there, there's a documentary, I think, called The Dropbox, where it is a man that's over in China who the children are, there's a box that people can take their unwanted children. And it was usually unwanted baby girls or maybe it was any kind of children that had some sort of physical condition or, you know, um, or genetic or, or uh, birth defect, whatever you have it, anything that they were unwanted, you could drop them off at this drop box. And it was always Christians that were taking care of them. It is, it's still, it still is today. Christians mm -hmm. are two and a half times as likely as the average person in the population to adopt. And in childcare programs and churches, there are a hundred, uh, there have got to be, uh, I think about a hundred thousand of them in the United States of America. And you can go right down the line, even care for people who are in addictions. That's largely church based. 130,000 churches have, have church based addiction programs. Um, Christians in the United States of America give so much time and so much money that it accounts actually for two. $2.67 trillion a year worth of the economy. And that is, you know, try to imagine what that means. The federal government, as big as it is, has a budget of about $6 trillion a year. So the value that Christians bring is actually more than the value that the federal government brings to people. Why do you think but, that people don't talk about this? Right? Why is this so, I mean, why would this be so shocking and unheard of to so many people? Well, I, you know, I, I just don't know if they've ever drawn the connections, but <laughs> there, there are a lot of people who they, they're, they feel that they would be justified in their internalized guilt and anger if Christianity weren't true. 
And listen, you can always find people who named the name of Jesus who did terrible things. Uh, But to just say, well, then that means all Christians are terrible. It's just very, very poor thinking. But keep in mind, these, this is not, these are not people who are committed to truth. Uh, Even being pro-life, I was just, is you think, well, that's great. So the Roman Christians picked up babies, but so what, how does that change the course of history? It turns out that when the Roman boys didn't have any little girl, any girls to get married to, they went to the church. They found the girls there. Will you marry me? Only if you become a Christian first. The historian and sociologist Rodney Stark called this secondary conversion. And he said, it actually is the real reason, as little known as this is, that Rome became Christian. And then, of course, the Christians in Rome spread throughout the world and brought Jesus to all over the planet. Yeah, absolutely. I guess this would be beyond the, you know, missionary dating is like missionary marriage back then, but people <laughs> yeah. are a little bit more consistent with what they believed in. And yeah, that that would be the thing. And w- one thing that I wish more people understood, and I was talking to a group of kids about this, is how Christianity actually predicts that we're going to have a group that's the, the, the wheat and the tares, and they are going to look almost identical on the outside, that there is going to be so many people that identify as Christians who are not Christians, but carry that name. And so I, what, in my experience, what I find is the wheat tends to find the wheat and the tares tend to find the tares. The te- tares also have a tendency to find the weak. And so just wreak havoc on there. And so that is the only Jesus that some people are, are, ever made aware of is they've had these people that are masquerading under the name of Christ that they don't even want to look at what the church is actually doing. So I think those are some great points. And I would just say for you mama bears that these are the kinds of things that if your kids are asking, if they're coming home from college saying that um, my friends are saying that pro-life people don't care about babies basically after they're born, you need to start having some of these stats, $6 trillion worth of work of after after kids are born, as they're going through education, as they're going through healthcare, as they are going through addictions, as they're going through mental health, all these different things, this is the kind of value that's being added. Um, yeah, yeah. So- and I, can I can I mention something about just uh, it, when kids come home from college? And I, mm-hmm. I know if if you if you've been there, you know how heartbreaking this is. Yes. The issue, and sometimes you think I don't even think this is actually my child, mm. and the reality is it actually isn't mentally or spiritually Mm. that when a person goes off to college and they are involved in mind control, it's almost as if they've been in a cult. They've been indoctrinated into a cult and they lose their authentic self. They've, they've had their behaviors conformed to the way their professors and their classmates want them to behave. They, they have, a, they've had a controlled amount of information, only given the information that their professors want them to have. Mm-hmm. They, they end, end up, uh, end up being in governed by the technology that is surrounding them. They've end up becoming emotionally sort of controlled. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's because bad worldviews. Uh, that are not not Christianity always end up controlling and devastating people. Yeah, uh, Marxist worldview, for example, you know, it, it tries to explain everything in terms of everything. the oppressor versus the oppressed. Mm-hmm. It becomes totalistic. Mm-hmm. And a totalistic worldview makes it impossible to think because yeah. it says, "Oh, if you know, if A, you know, A came about because capitalists are evil, and." If that if A is not present and it's my, negative A or non A, then that also came about because you know and all of a sudden you can't <laughs> think about anything anymore because it's uh, you know it's somehow the Christians are always to blame. Yeah, that is a, that's an indication of a false worldview at play. And yeah. there are things you can do, but you have to recognize this goes way deeper than just your child coming home and saying a professor said this on a certain day. Yeah. And so this is something that uh, we talk about in one of our books is that the quote from uh, Daniel Kahneman, David Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman, one of the Kahnemans, anyway, thinking fast and slow, where he says the brain has a hard time distinguishing between that which is familiar and that which is true. So basically, you repeat it until it becomes familiar and you keep repeating it until they think it's true. And at that point, they've heard it so many times from so many different people off at school, it that becomes what is true to them just because they've heard it so many times. And you mentioned how sometimes parents think uh, their kids come home and they're like, this isn't my child. What do you recommend for parents that are going through kind of almost a paradigm shift like this with their child? What do you recommend them doing? Are are there any ministries that are specifically for 
my child came home completely different. What do I do next? Maybe it's parents who just hadn't woken up to the fact that they needed to prepare their kids for these ideas. And now they're faced with the consequence that this child is not the same child that they raised. Yeah. Well, it's best to prepare them. If you can't, it's best to repair them. And so mm. they're two, they're, th- those two things are that that's actually literally what we do at Summit yeah. Ministries and the 11 day student conferences we hold in Manatee Springs, Colorado and in Lookout Mountain, Georgia where students come and if they're, well, I don't, it doesn't matter to me if they claim a faith with, of G, in Jesus, as long as they're a learner, are they a learner? Are they curious? If they are, then they can come. We will love them. We will give them instruction from the top Christian thought leaders who've thought through all of these issues. They can bring their list of questions with them. I've had students bring lists of 30 questions that they want to ask about God and that they just can't seem to resolve. They never got answered in church or they've had church hurt or whatever else. Just bring all those questions with you. Then we'll try to help them develop a basis of a biblical worldview. We will actually teach them what the counterfeit worldviews are that dominate, especially in colleges and universities. So they can kind of gently realize they've been indoctrinated by these false worldviews and then find their way back. And it it is powerful, the impact that it has. 95% of young adults, by the time they finish that 11-day program, so they embrace a biblical worldview. Nice. Because you can't refute what you don't understand. If you don't understand it, you can't refute it. You can't be like, oh, right. that's the kind of indoctrination I've been getting. If you don't see it, it's like a fish trying to describe water. They can't do it. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And once they see a biblical truth, then it becomes easier to see everything else. The way C.S. Mm-hmm. Lewis you know, put it is, is, is so classic. I, I believe in Christianity. I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. One of my favorite quotes. Absolutely. And that's what they learn to do. So we study them one year, five years, 10 years out, 85% stay strong in a biblical worldview. Oh, good. So you can get them to see. Yes. If you get them to see the world from the standpoint of truth, it has a long term, powerful impact on them. So I would say that probably if we were going to be going through kind of a history of apologetics, what we're seeing maybe previously is the question of, is this true? But I would say that uh, we have now shifted into, is this good? It's almost like people don't even care if it's true or not. They care if it's good. And I think that's what you address in your book, Truth Changes Everything. So what are some other examples of uh, us being able to show that Christianity is not just true, but it's actually good for the world in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the healthcare and the justice. I-, I would love to hear you talk about justice, especially just because that is such a buzzword that's going on that everybody needs justice. You know, the climate needs justice. Reproductive organs need justice. Everything needs justice. What is justice and how has Christianity actually given the world a kind of justice that maybe all the secular answers can't provide? Well, ju- justice basically means that you you treat each person as an image bearer of God, mm-hmm. that there's some standard by which everybody ought to be treated, whether they're rich or poor, whether they have a lot of uh, resources or they, they don't in terms of intelligence or social connections or or whatever else. And there are two kinds of justice mentioned in in scripture. One of them is what it takes to create a just society. And the other one is how do you restore justice when it gets broken? Mm. So for example, there are all these really baffling passages, the book of Exodus and Leviticus. And every time I read through them, I read the Bible through every year. And Mm. sometimes I smile at them because you're like, how on earth do you understand this? For example, if a man digs a pit and his neighbor's ox or donkey falls into a pit, then the owner of the, of the the pit shall make restoration. Mm-hmm. You think, why, how does that relate to my life? I don't dig pits. I don't, <laughs> my neighbors don't have large animals. You know, what do I do? What do I do with this? Mm-hmm. But Baron Lord Atkin, who is the guy who developed what we now call tort law, mm-hmm. which is probably half the system of law in the United States of America, said it goes back to that passage in scripture. How do you make right when something has gone wrong? And so we have laws about negligence. Out of that came laws telling employers, you ha- if you've got a dangerous piece of equipment, you're responsible if the employee gets hurt. So you have to make sure you've got safety measures in place. Mm. So, you know, people wear yellow vests when they're standing out on the street working. Why? Because of, because of tort law, which goes back to a biblical principle that was applied by Christian lawyers. In international law, Hugo Grotius 
is one of the core people who developed international law. This is one of those He's a, he was one of those guys that would just make you sick when you're a kid. Like he had his doctorate by the time he was 15. He wrote, <laughs> uh, he literally, he wrote books on two things. He wrote books on international law and he wrote books on ap Christian apologetics. Okay. And, and then he became the source of John Locke, who the founders of the United States of America turned to, to try to form out what a constitutional republic might actually look like. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, to me, it's just fascinating when you just go, you go back in time and you realize, man, when people start with biblical reasoning, they can produce all these great results. When you start yeah. with reasoning about the oppressor versus the oppressed, what happens? Well, you end up with the Soviet Union. You end up with communist China. You know, more people died at the hands of their own governments in the 20th century than all other previous centuries of human history put together. Yeah. If you begin with the idea that humans bear God's image and that we can create a society that brings blessing and flourishing, you might not always agree on every political issue, but you'll definitely have a completely different approach. You'll want to set people free, not yeah. constrain them or hurt them. So um, I would say three of the other areas that you talk about are specifically science, medicine, and education. These are also areas that I see that are becoming very highly secularized, not just secularized, but I would say that the Marxist worldview, which we probably don't have time to go into all of what's going on within the Marxist worldview here. But if, if you follow us in Mama Bear, you know that we talk about that a lot. But let's talk specifically about science. It's like there's this myth that science and faith have always been at odds, which is an absolute myth. And when you start reading the actual scientists who were doing the groundbreaking science, you're like, how did anyone come up with this, this idea? So we're going to talk about science. We're talking, um, going to talk about um, medicine and especially education. Because uh, this, again, these would be very good examples of womb to tomb kind of caregiving that the church has uh, traditionally given. So which take your pick, which one of those you want to talk about first? Well, I think science and medicine fit together pretty well, yeah. Hillary. So you, you, if you go back into the history of science and look at what developed modern science, you will find the fingerprints of Jesus followers all over it. And that's not accidental. It isn't just that some Christians happen or some Christians happened to be scientists or some scientists happened to be Christians. It was actually that a, a biblical worldview makes science possible. Before the Christian worldview really emerged, people believed based on the Greeks and the Romans that the universe was eternal. If it, if it's eternal, that means it never came into existence, which means that our existence here is not really knowable. We only know because we can somehow speculate about what might be the immaterial world. If there is a God force in the world, what it might be like. So that's why philosophy became so important to people. But, you know, in a, in a biblical worldview, they said, no, oh, the world actually exists and it's stable which means it yields itself to understanding. If you do an experiment at time A and an experiment at time B, you know that you're experimenting in the same world. Yeah. You also know that the world is good, but it's not God. Mm -hmm. So you can study it without offending the deities, right? Yeah. there was. I think uh, so many of the world religions, they're trying to get away from the physical as, as if the physical matter were bad. And and that's why you saw a lot of philosophers that are coming out of those times and, oh, we don't mix ourselves up with the farmers and the people who are messing with all that dirty stuff. But Christians are saying, no, God, everything God created is good. So whether or not I'm sitting here thinking about it or my hands are steeped in all of the physical matter, that is itself a type of goodness that other, it's like we take for granted that other worldviews actually really denigrated the physical world. So it is true that at various points in time, there have been people who led different churches, different denominations, Catholic or Protestant, who were against science. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the church as in like the structure. I'm talking about yeah. individual people who loved Jesus and believed that Jesus is the truth. Yeah. Think about people like Nicholas Copernicus. He said, the very act of doing science is an act of worship of the almighty God. And he was fascinating in the way he studied, by the way, he did his astronomy work because he was interested in finding the specific date of the resurrection of Jesus. Oh, interesting. And, and then he realized, man, all our calculations are not working out quite right. What if we put <laughs> the sun at the center instead of the earth? And all of a sudden they, they worked out. It, it's some, sometimes it's just bizarre how these things happen, but, but he really is correct. It is an act of worship. And mm -hmm. ever since that time, people have thought, hmm, you know, I think there may not be this battle between science and religion that I always thought there was. Yeah. To the, according to 
uh, John Lennox, who's a you know the PhD mathematician from Oxford University. I love him. Two thirds of the people who've ever won the Nobel Prize in Science were Christians. Mm -hmm. Rodney Stark, the historian I mentioned a little bit earlier, went back and looked at all of the individuals whose work we say was the foundation of modern science. There were 52 of these individuals. Only one of them, Hillary, was an atheist. Mm -hmm. Only one, Edward Halley. The others were believed in God, and 50 of those believed in the God of the Bible. In fact, two-thirds of them were so committed to their faith that, like Robert Boyle, they actually wrote devotional books mm. as well as doing their science, and that is yeah. something that continues even until this day. So yeah, the, the, I think a lot of times people think, oh, it was just what they did at the time that, you know, you just kind of said, oh, I'm a Christian because that's how everybody was. But what they don't realize is they were saying it's because of my Christian beliefs that I'm studying X, Y, Z, because I see this about God and I know that he created. So therefore, I'm expecting to see this in universe. So what are some of like the examples of like that? Oh, wow. Well, um, I was just actually... I did it on my own podcast on the Dr. Jeff show. I interviewed Tom Redelius. Tom is a, you know, PhD from Harvard in physics. He's, he did his postdoctoral work at the Institute for Advanced Studies, which is the Institute of Princeton University founded by Albert Einstein. And now he's a professor at one of the top 20 doctor, doctoral programs in physics in the world. And he, he's a Jesus follower. And, and I asked him about that because he's what he's studying is string theory. There's some fascinating stuff. You know, even people who aren't believers are saying, I don't, you know, it's very difficult to ever prove that string theory is actually true. But but the people who are working on it are doing it because it actually is beautiful. It's a beautiful theory, as well as something that they think might have explanatory value. That's fascinating to me. Because they, they realize we as human beings were designed to be discoverers. This is part of who we were made to be. And that discovery doesn't just fulfill our minds. It actually helps us do practical things in the real world. So when you look back at the people who developed the whole idea of modern, uh, the modern medicine, the idea of developing hospitals where you actually take care of people who are sick rather than just throw them away. All of that goes back to Jesus followers. And even today, even though the medical care system has largely been taken over by other institutions, still probably about 15% of the hospitals in, in, the, in the world are run by Christian organizations, Presbyterian mm -hmm. groups, Baptist groups, Moravian Baptist groups, um, Methodists. Uh, Catholic mm -hmm. groups, Methodists, mm -hmm. yes. Um, even Adventists, one of the big hospital systems here in Colorado is an Adventist system. And, you know, and it's brilliant. And they they have a different perspective on medicine. It's not mm -hmm. just about running people through a system, but yeah. actually caring about them because they are souls. Yes. Absolutely. So science and medicine we see just really owes so much of what it does to worldview. Um, and, and just the, specifically the Christian worldview of not only making it so that people me are meaningful, but matter is meaningful, the world is meaningful, and the world has meaning to begin with. Like you were talking about, you know, the Greeks and other gods, if you have these capricious gods that are the ones that are deciding on all the specific laws of physics, they didn't have ideas of laws of physics anytime, any more than we would have an idea of some law-like principle that somebody was in charge of. It's always going to be a piece of them and their personality, but God says he changes not. And so they were able to count on this fact that God was law-like. Therefore, we can expect to have order out of this chaos. So I just, uh, I love studying that. And I would still say that um, my time in my master's in biology was almost more worshipful than anything I've ever done in seminary. That I, I just that. love, lo it, it just made me understand God more and just made me worship. I remember just bowing next to my some of my textbooks and microbiology and just, oh my gosh, God, you are so great. You are so magnificent. Like, I can't <laughs> believe you organized this, this so well. And it's just, I was always just overwhelmed with awe of how complex God's design was. Um, yeah, I see. I do, and that leads to education, actually, then. Yes. Because it, you, you realize, wow, everything I study is an act of worship. Yes. Every science class I take is an opportunity to worship. Everything I study really mm -hmm. is an opportunity to worship. Yeah. So, and you, and you would expect, therefore, that Christians had a large influence on the founding of education. And some of it came about in very odd ways. Like, um, you know, I tell in, in the book, True Changes Everything, I, I tell the stories of some of these early educators. Colin Bonus was an Irish monk. He got a hold of the gospel somehow, 
Jesus said, go into all the world. He said, I got to go. I got to figure out how to go. And his brother monk said, you know, we're, we're on an island. Uh, we really can't go anywhere. He said, let's build a boat. He had him build a boat out of animal skins. No oh, oars, wow. no sail. He just, they just pushed him out into the water and he floated <laughs> away. And he, he, land, he landed in England. This is, I guess this just demonstrates God's sense of humor. He, <laughs> land, he, he landed in England. He went ashore. He gathered all these warlords together and said, okay, everybody, we need to, uh, we all need to become Christians because this, we've got this new revelation from this guy named Jesus. And when you got to help you build a church, they started gathering books. They built a library. The library became a monastery. The monastery became a seminary. The seminary became a university. And then he did it over and over again. He did it. A, more than a dozen times all throughout Europe. And, and many of these institutions exist today. And, you know, our friend Jay Warner Wallace points out that top 15 universities in the world were all started as Christian institutions because it was Christians who valued education. If no, nothing really means anything, you know, if there's no point to this life, then why bother with education? Yeah. But if we seek to bear God's image and God is curious and loves it when we learn and grow, then we should see everything we do as an act of worship. Absolutely. I love that. And, and, and uh, what would you say that same would, would go with not just in education, but within orphanages? And this would be another area yeah. where it's like we have the caretaking of children and the teaching of children. You think of how many schools uh, just even on the K through 12 level has started out there. What was, uh, you know, or maybe like the com community schools, not the way they're defining them now, but um, when we first had people that were coming over to America's, how were Christians involved with that? Well, it was it was largely Christians who decided that we needed to have a system of education so that everybody could learn. Mm. They wanted universal literacy primarily because they wanted everybody to read the Bible. Yep. Because scripture says in Colossians chapter 2 that in him in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So if you want to access the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, you've got to be able to read the Bible, which means you have to be able to read and and universal literacy but it's even deeper than that which i this is part something i find fascinating i wrote about this in, in a chapter on education in the book truth changes everything go back to this guy john wickliffe he was a professor at oxford university which by the way was started as a seminary out of a monastery out of a conversion uh, conversionary view of christianity and and he said, look, I think people need to be able to read the Bible in English. This was a heretical thought at that time. Latin was considered to be the finest language in all of history. Everybody in the church believed that. And English was an unformed language. It was rather rude. To translate something into English would be like adding curse words every third or fourth word. <laughs> And so you just wouldn't, you wouldn't do it. In fact, it was punishable in some places wow. and at some times in history by death. William Tyndale was actually burned at the stake for his work. If you read the Tyndale Bible, you notice that it just stops at a certain point. That's because he got killed. Wow. For I didn't doing know that. this. Well, John Wycliffe. Um, he succeeded. He took the Latin and turned it into English. And, and in the process of doing it, he had to form the English language because there weren't enough words in English to describe the principles that are in scripture. So he gave them words to those, to those ideas. Oh, there are wow. 1,100 words used in the Wycliffe translation of the Bible that are used for the first time in English in the Wycliffe translation. Wow. Of the Bible. I didn't know that. Yes. Including words like mystery, uh, first fruits, persuasion, even the word wordy is used for the first <laughs> time. And, and so think about how significant that is. Here you got mm. this guy, little Oxford University, you know, doing his, his little translation work at his desk and it's cold and it's dark, but he's forming out a language that will ultimately become the dominant trade language of the world that yeah. will lead to a level of prosperity so that today, for the first time in history, more than half of the people world in the world live at a middle class level or higher. Mm -hmm. And it all happened. It all goes back to one Christian who decided to be faithful in the little thing he was given. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's so beautiful. I, I e even now I interpret all this. I, I hear like this, this one small faithfulness here, a small faithfulness here, and I'm like, that's what the body of Christ looks like. As we have yes. all these little cells being faithful to what that little cell is supposed to do, and it just brings, you know, it just multiplies and brings out, you know, tissues and organs and just into the beautiful body of Christ. Um, so how would you recommend that if parents are talking to their kids and their kids are making some of these claims, um, sometimes it doesn't help to just tell them, well, no, you know, that, you know, it's not that, you know, they say, well, Christian, you know, they, they ruined all the justice stuff. They ruined all the medical stuff. You can't just say, uh, uh, you know, and leave it at that. What are some of the questions that will actually 
help to uncover a faulty worldview that the person is already believing that parents could start to ask, even if they can't memorize all this information that you're just able to spat off, what are some really wise questions that they could ask to get their child to start thinking along those lines? Well, to me, the most significant thing is to, to be position yourself to be asking questions and to develop Mm -hmm. that relationship of trust. Yeah. So my five favorite words are, tell me more about that. Mm. Uh, just, just be a curious person. If your child is learning things just because they came back from school and heard something doesn't mean that they believe that forever, but it might mean that they just are interested in sharing it. If they're sharing it with you, they trust you to a certain degree. So you can ask if they aren't interested in sharing, uh, because I've had four children, some of them wanted to talk all day and all night, others, not so much. (laughs) So, um, you know, I would, I would do things like, Hey, this issue came up in, uh, in the news. And I'm just curious if anybody at your school is talking about that. Ooh, that's good. I like right? that. Right. Or so, uh, tell, you know, help me understand. Never underestimate the value of playing dumb. Mm-hmm. Help me understand why would people believe this? Mm-hmm. And then there, and sometimes your kids are like, you know what? My parents are so dumb. I just need to have <laughs> compassion on them and explain everything to them. Well, they're talking, they're trusting you. You're creating a safe environment. Then you can start asking questions like, now, when you use that term justice, tell me, give me a definition. What do you mean? Yeah. And you, then you use the term social justice. That's interesting. Isn't justice just justice or is there, are there certain kinds of justice or, you know, help, help me understand that. What do you mean by that? The second one is, how do you know that's true? Mm -hmm. You know, what's your source for that? It, we live in a, a world that is so dominated by conspiracies, mm. right? Those people that you yes. always hear somebody say, they did they, this, this, this to us. Whoever right? they the, is, but they the, always say weird things. Yeah, <laughs> the they, you know, and they're, they're hurting us. But ask for specifics. Who, who are you specifically talking about? Yeah. What specifically did they do? How do you know that's true? How do you know that the report you got is actually the correct one? Mm -hmm. If there was another way to approach this or other information, would you be interested in knowing? Is your mind still open to exploring this? That's an important question of like, if there was a completely different perspective on this, would you, would you be open to hearing it? Because if they say, nope, I mean, that, that they've kind of closed that door. And so you don't necessarily need to go and bang, bang your head against that wall. They've let you know what they think to yeah, begin with. Yeah. But you um, put a pebble in their shoe, right? Yeah. At that yeah, point, as Greg Kogel says, you oh, put yeah, a pebble exactly. in their shoe because they realize, <laughs> oh, I thought, I thought I was coming into this going to educate my, my silly parents. Yep. And now I realize I'm the one who's closed off. Yeah, who's maybe- really open-minded here. Yeah, maybe I don't know as much as I thought I did. Yeah, maybe I'm not as open minded as I thought because they asked me if I'd want to know the other side. And I said, no, like, I think sometimes just the idea of wanting to appear open and appear tolerant will make will almost force people to say, well, yeah, of course, I'd want to hear the other side, even if they don't think it. But I mean, it's it's a great in it's it's there. You're still playing by the rules that they've they've really laid down for the conversation. And so in that sense, you're really, truly loving them by, um, by really being able to listen. And I like what you said, just, you know, explain that to me. I think people really enjoy being able to explain stuff to people. So. Yes. um, Yeah. Well, there are great sources of information and you've got great sources at at mama bear. Uh, uh, We have a lot of things at summit ministries as well. A lot of people who've been on your show have are also speakers at summit ministries and mm -hmm. they make little short videos on all different kinds of things that kids are asking about. So the resource library at summit ministries is available for anybody who wants to come and take a look at it. And, and you can find books on just about any of these, any of these topics. Um, I always try to help kids trace back the source of the information. Yes. So wh- how do you know that source is credible? Mm-hmm. Beyond just the fact that it was one used by your professor in a class. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. How do you know that it's credible? So I start asking questions like that as well, because I, I want, I don't want my kids to be cynical, but mm-hmm. I want them to be thoughtful. Yes. And they need to be discerning. What makes a good source? How would you know? Oh, somebody says, well, eight, you know, don't you know that Columbus came and he killed 8 million people? How do you know that's true? Yeah. That's interesting. How would you even know if there were 8 million people there? Mm-hmm. Right. Who came up with that idea? 
Yeah, who did the when, census did, before yeah. him? <laughs> how, how did they figure that out? You, so, so these questions we're talking about allow you to go deeper and deeper and deeper, and you're planting seeds of doubt about what is untrue. But again, and this is so important, and I think I love the way you do this at Mama Bear. You, it's not like you're trying to convert them at the end of the conversation. They say, mom, you're right. I'm wrong. You know, but you want them to grow as people. You want them to be healthy individuals. And once you have that perspective and you can free yourself, you know, let God take charge of the outcome. You just be faithful in the process. Then that just, it just really ends up being an, a lot more fun, but also a lot more productive in the long term. Yeah. Parents have that beautiful job of if you do it right, you work yourself out of a job. And that's kind of our goal is to create just yeah. logical, rational thinkers to the point where they don't need us to be guiding them on these things. They know how to sift through information. They know about how to be discerning, how to look at what is good, what is uh, true, what is beautiful, how to look at origins, how to look at uh, furthest uh, consequences to ideas, and just really be able to draw the dots together. So yeah. thank you so much for talking with us about that. And again, for everybody. The book here is Truth Changes Everything. I've personally benefited from this because of so many conversations I have with people about how they think the Christian faith has just ruined everything that it touches. Uh, and sometimes they'll come out and say that. And so it's just patently false. And so it, it's really not only encouraging to have something to back it up with a conversation that you're having with someone who disagrees, but also to back it up for yourself to know that I can absorb these accusations knowing that they aren't true. Yes. about what it says about the church. And therefore, I can then still maintain my faith in Christ, knowing, Lord, you bring goodness to this world mm -hmm. and following your truths, following your precepts um, and the heart of Christ, it brings goodness to the world. So yeah, thank you so much, so Dr. Good. Jeff Myers, so for talking with us about that. And um, yeah. I, I would like to mention um, one more thing, because I yeah, did mention absolutely. the Summit Ministries program. So if, you, if, you, if you're if you a mama bear and you've got a child between 16 to 22, and I was driving back from a meeting to get ready to get on this call, and, and one, of the, one of our team members emailed me and said, if the mama bears want their kids to come to Summit, have them put in a coupon code. Yes. For $200 off of the program. And it's I, I love this. Roar 24. Yahoo! How about that? Roar <laughs> 24. It. So you just go to summit.org and you can fill out the information for their, there are nine different selections throughout the summer of these 11 day events. And they're all going to have the same caliber of speakers. We're going to love on your kids and we're going to help them come to a knowledge of the truth that sets them free. Sets them so free. So just Roar 24. Roar 24, Mama Bears. So if you want your child to be ex have this experience and to be able to uh, have this training, absolutely go to Summit Ministries. We highly recommend them. And uh, yeah, tell us about your experience after you get back. So thank you so much. And we will talk with y'all in another week or two. Bye-bye.